Lord, we've decided we will not be silenced. We will always worship you. And Lord, as long as we are breathing, as long as we have breath in our bodies, we've made up our mind to worship you. And so we thank you and we bless you and we trust you for all that you will do in us and through us and for us. Have your way in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we celebrate the Lord? Can we do that? Anybody made up their mind, you're going to worship the Lord no matter what? Anybody say they make up their mind, I'm not going to be silent? As long as I got breath in my body, I will worship you. Anybody know? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise for our praise team for leading us into God's throne room the way they did? Amen. 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 Y'all doing all right today? Amen. On this first Sunday in June, first, second day of June, as we get into the summer here, God is good and our worship is good. I want to I wanna, um, encourage you to check out the gig. A lot of things going on this summer. I want you to be a part of it. But I want to applaud the men on yesterday. The Lord met us, church, here on yesterday. Um, we had about 65, 70 men that came out on yesterday. Give the Lord a... And um, I especially want to encourage the men because you invited your friends and, and I met a lot of new people and uh, God really met us. And so to all the men, just wave your hand if you were there on yesterday. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise for our men. God is doing something special in our midst and uh, we're excited about it. Never at the expense of our sisters, amen? But it's good to see men coming together and honestly dealing with issues. I, I want to I want to jump into this new series we did, The DNA of Hurt. I want to talk about Jesus. Um, and boy, that's a broad topic. Ooh, I'll be honest with you. I'll tell you, uh, you can't get ready for that. <laughs> but I um, really felt the Lord laid this passage on my heart. This is a passage of scripture that influenced me personally, uh, probably more than, no more than any passage in scripture, and brought me to the place of faith in what I believe. Um, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I believe we're in a day that the church may need Jesus more than the world because a lot of Christian behavior is unlike Jesus. And, and we need to come back and fall in love with Jesus. I, I, I don't know of some of the stuff I see sometimes. And, and I'm, I'm including myself as well. It's, it's always to get fresh eyes on the one who redeems you. And so I want to just kick off this series uh, looking at this passage of Scripture, the DNA of Jesus. And, and let's look at that. Let's, let's be recaptivated by his love. Let's re-engage this relationship with fresh eyes, uh, a fresh heart, an open heart, and allow him to transform us. So I want to look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. And here's what it says. One of my favorite passages of scripture, have this attitude in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, also, God highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow those who are in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I, I just love that, that hymn. I love it. I love it. And so I want to talk about a good friend. Tell your neighbor, he's a good friend. Yeah, I want to jump into this. I got a quote here on the screen. If you don't read the newspaper, you are uninformed. If you read the newspaper, you are misinformed. 
and that was spoken by Mark Twain a number of years ago. That sounds pretty relevant today, isn't it? Yeah, we live in a day of sound bites, false news, false narratives. Um, we live in a day where people can watch a three-minute YouTube video and think they're an expert on a subject. Watch a heart surgery on YouTube. Now you ready to do heart surgery? <laughs> Tell your neighbor something wrong with that. <laughs> and and I really believe this. Not only the world, but I would say the church. I believe we treat Jesus the same way. That there's a sense that we're uninformed and misinformed of the greatness and the glory of Jesus Christ. And so what I want to do in this series is a lot I want to say. I have to I have to really confine it. This is a passage that has influenced me and affected me personally in my walk. And I pray that it influences you. But I want to look at him with fresh, eye, fresh eyes. And hopefully and prayerfully that all of us will be able to take a deeper dive into Jesus. Amen? And so this, this story, this, this letter that Paul writes, it's a thank you letter. I'm sure your mother taught you that when somebody does something good for you, you ought to do what? Say thank you. And that's what Paul does. He, he writes this thank you letter to this church at Philippi wants to thank them for reaching out to him. When he writes it, he's under, uh, he's, un, he's, he's been arrested by a Roman authority. Some put him in prison. He really wasn't in prison. He was under house arrest. Uh, he was under house arrest for preaching the gospel. Now, you got to understand, Paul was an apostle, meaning that he was kind of known. We would say nationally. He was known in a number of countries, in Israel, in Greek, I mean, Roman, Rome. So he was nationally known. So you can imagine the context. It's all over CNN. It's all over MSNBC. It's all over Facebook. The great apostle Paul has been arrested. Okay? This, this great preacher for Jesus is in jail. Them cotton-picking Christians. And, and as what is human, uh, a human proclivity, the churches that he started and the churches that he ministered to, because he was kind of a bishop, he kind of pastored all these churches, they distanced themselves from him. All that time he spent down in Corinth. Nobody from Corinth sent word to Paul to check up on him. All the preaching he did down in Ephesus, that, that bougie church, that, that high theology church, nobody from that so-called spiritual church in Ephesus came to see about him. The Colossae church that was dealing with all the legalism in that church and all the self-righteousness and everybody there is anointed. Nobody was anointed enough to go check on Paul from Colossae. But this little church, Philippi, they weren't, they weren't nationally known. Not only did they send some financial support, knowing that he needed some support in his imprisonment, but they sent a member from the church by the name of Epaphroditus and wanted to check in on Paul. And Paul was grateful, and so he writes this letter to say thank you. You checked on me in my time of need. Because how many of y'all know it's when you're in difficulty, you find out who your true friends are? And that's what happened with Paul here. He found out that the Philippian church could be a good friend. And he says, thank you. In my darkest hour, thank you for being a friend. Thank you for reaching out to me. Thank you for sending support that I didn't have to go through this by myself. And, and this is a footnote for the record. If I ever do get arrested, y'all better come see me now. I'm telling you right now. I said I'll be cotton picking, okay? <laughs> he did all that preaching and they didn't even come check out on him. I said, no, no, don't y'all do that. But that's what Paul does. He, he thanks them. He thanks them for that and he's appreciative. And, and he basically says to them, you checked on me. You've been a wonderful Wonderful church, you're a good friend. And if I can say something about the DNA of Jesus for today, I would say he's a good friend. He, 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 he's the son of God, he's the savior, he's the holy one. He delivers us from our sins, he forgives us, but he's also a good friend. He's the Christ. Christ is not his last name. It's not Jesus from Mr. Christ, the family Christ. No, Christ is a title. It's anointed one. It's the Messiah, Jesus the Messiah, the one who would come and make the world a better place. He's all that, yes, but, but even beyond that, he's a good friend. He's a good friend. 
Um, he's a deliverer. He's a strong tower. He's light in my darkness. He's a healer. And some of you, many of you can testify that God can heal you. But, but beyond the healing, when the healing is done, wants to be our friend. Jesus is a good friend. And, and, and that's my word today for us is that we, we need to engage the friendship. Some of you are here right now, it's kind of dark outside. You're going through your own issues. You don't understand. It feels like God may have abandoned you. And this word is God's message to you that he's still a friend. He's still a friend. Some of you have lost some friends. Newsflash, you ain't need them anyway. If they, can't with, if they can't be with you in the thick of it, they sure ain't going to be with you when you really need, you, when you need them. Amen? Amen. And, and maybe, maybe, maybe God has allowed you to lose those friends that you might gain the friendship of Jesus. You know, sometimes God has to remove some people for us to really see him as he is. Amen? Amen. Some of you, some of you, you know, you kind of got out of the friends business. You had friends and, and you, you kind of like, you kind of a lone ranger. You don't have, lone ranger, you don't have Tonto with you all by yourself. You Batman without Robin. You Gladys Knight without the pips. You, you all by yourself. You've gotten out of the friends business because you're tired of putting up with the drama. And Jesus says, look, I, 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 I want to be a good friend. I want to be a good friend. I want to be a good friend. That's what this, 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 this text, what I want to take from this today for us, it's, 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 it's heavy in relational terms and it moves us out of religion and all the rules and jumping through the religious hoops and move into relationship where real transformation and change can happen with us. Just a couple things I want to say about this, this text today. Uh, it's a text that is really drop in the context of conflict. There's a lot of infighting in this church. They were a good friend to Paul, but they were not friendly to one another. Matter of fact, in chapter four, there's two women that are fighting over who would lead the hospitality ministry. And Paul had to call them out in the letter. He had to call them out, sit down for a minute. And, and basically he's telling them, y'all got the wrong attitude. This, this attitude of competition, this attitude of ambition, this attitude of status, you know, you think it's all about the title in the kingdom. No, it's not about title. It's about substance. And so he says in verse 5, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who existed in the form of God, but did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. And here's what he's saying. Jesus is a good friend because he emphasizes substance over status. If anybody had a right to pull rank, it was Jesus. And Paul, really, he's coming in that spirit when he speaks into the life of this church as an apostle. He says, look, I have the rank. I birthed this church. I, I'm kind of the pastor of this church. If anybody could pull title and rank, it's me. But I don't come that way. I come as a servant. I come with substance. I come with character. I come with heart. And, and, and that's the spirit of Jesus. He, he existed in the form of God. It speaks to his divinity. He's God and man. And he has the right to kind of announce to the world, don't you know who I am? I'm God. But that's not how he comes. He doesn't come in a, in a, a king's chariot. He doesn't come and sit in a king's palace. He doesn't come in a throne. No, he's born in a manger. He, he, he doesn't come with an escort of angels. He comes by himself. And he chooses individuals who are less than and does something in their life to make them greater. Because it's not the status, it's not the title, it's not the accolades, but it's what's on the inside. It's the substance that makes us. Oh, I wish we'd get that back in the church. It's not what we are on the outside. It's what has been touched and changed on the inside. Matthew chapter 17, the Bible says Jesus took them on the top of Mount Her Hermon, uh, where the, what is called the Mount of Transfiguration. And there, when he was with Peter, James, and John, he, he, he unveiled his humanity and revealed his essence, his divinity. And it was so great, they, they, Peter said, Let, let's just stay here. We don't want to come off this mountain. And really, it's a word about the work of God in us. When we take off the, the label, when we take off all the Christian language and all the cliches, when we put down our beliefs and theology, who are we? 
Is there substance there? See, the danger of the Christian faith is you can learn the language, you can learn the scriptures, you can take a few classes, you can learn all the external stuff, and it never affects your heart. And, and in here, Paul is saying, look, it's, it's deeper than skin deep, y'all. It, this is something that ought to get in your heart. You, you, you can't walk with Jesus every day and remain the same person. Do I, do I have a witness on that? If you walk with Jesus every day, you're going to walk a little bit different after a little while. I, I, I don't need to try to uh, live up to some rules. As long as I'm walking with Jesus, I will walk a different way. And that's what he's, he's kind of pushing here. There, there, there needs to be some substance in us. There, uh, we we got we to gotta have some substance of who we are, and we got to be careful. This is an issue of self-worth and how we feel about ourselves, and that's kind of the... The, the sense of our culture is a culture of titles and ambition and status. And we know that. We, we've come across people. They've, they've got the title. They've got the resume. They've got the education. But after you sit down with them after five minutes, there's not so much substance to their life. And I wonder if the church have chased after that rabbit. I, I wonder sometimes, are we deceived into thinking that it's what you have on the outside that makes the person? But I stopped by to tell you, if you have nothing on the inside, you're nothing on the outside. But if you walk with Jesus long enough, does anybody know God can put some substance and some strength and some character on the inside? He can do that. There are many titles that I want to play off here. Here, this text deals with the Son of God and His essence and His incarnation. Uh, but there are many titles that are used to describe Jesus. Um, uh, he's called the Son of God. It, that's a dual term. There's divinity to who he is, but also his authority as he's at the right hand of the Father. Uh, the Son of David comes in that spirit as a king. We tend to think of David and his, his uh, mishap, his misstep with Bathsheba. But David was a great king in that he cared for the people. So here was a king that actually cared. He could relate. He wasn't like this president that was non-relatable and crazy. Amen. But think of it, if he was a president, he can come in and sit amongst the people. Doesn't need his entourage, doesn't need his uh, secret service. He's a relatable individual. That's, that's the sense of son of David. He's called the word incarnate. He's called the prophet, the Messiah, the Christ. But the favorite, his most favorite title is one called the son of man. He, he was fond of using that of himself, and the New Testament writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're very fond of calling Jesus the Son of Man. And quite simply, it does have apocalyptic and eschatological implications from Daniel chapter 7, but quite specifically, it simply says that he was saying, I'm just a man. And my question to us as Christians, do we just struggle with just being ourselves? Because I've discovered a long time ago, if I'm just myself with God, God will change what's not right about me. I don't have to put on this mask. I don't have to put on religion. I don't have to put on all this stuff. I, I don't have to try to be something that I'm not. If I simply come as I am, God will take what is there, and he'll change it and make a difference. And I'm challenging the church that Jesus loves us enough. We don't have to put on pretense. We don't have to put on makeup and all this stuff. Just come as we are. The same Jesus that saved us, he can still change us. All my issues, all my faults, and all my flaws, just bring them to him. And that same one who redeemed me, and the same one who saved me, he'll change me. And the very thing I don't like about myself, he'll be gracious to me, and he'll turn it and make it something that, make it something that is good and usable for his kingdom. I like, I like how uh, uh, um, um, Van Moody says it in his book, The Eye Factor. He says it like this. Listen to these words. Trying to please and impress other people or to live up to their expectations is exhausting and frustrating. Isn't that our culture today? People rarely succeed at it because when they do it, they suppress and deny their true selves as they pretend to be smarter, wealthier, more attractive, more charismatic, more gifted, or more connected than they really believe themselves to be. 
If they only knew how valuable they actually are, they could save some more, so much energy and be so much more authentic and enjoy life so much more. What I'm saying is that in Jesus Christ, I don't have to put on airs. I don't have to try to be something I'm not. That God challenged me every day, just be Autry, just be Terrence. And if you come to me as Terrence, I'll do a work in your life that'll make you stronger. I'll develop you. I'll use you. Just be who you are. And God can begin to build the substance in our hearts. So the year from the outside, we may not look like we're much, but on the inside, when people get close to us, there's something different about you. Y'all know I got to say something about the NBA playoffs, right? You know I love the NBA. Say amen. Just say amen. You've been here 20 years. You know that. All right? But I got to say, I love this Kawhi Leonard. I love this, this dude. I, I, I want Toronto to win. I'm going to say it. I want them to win. If you're a Golden State fan, I'm praying for your deliverance, <laughs> praying for your salvation, all that stuff. But I like Kawhi Leonard. One, number one, he, he's, not, he's not into this flash. You know, he comes to the post-game conference in a, in a T-shirt. You know, superstars, you know, they come with dark shades on, and they got all the flash. They want you to know they're a superstar. But mama said, if you got to let folk know you somebody, maybe you ain't somebody. <laughs> okay? But Kawhi, he doesn't roll like that. And he's worth millions. He drives the same car he drove in college. Because you know what he said? Watch this. I just love to play basketball. And I wish the church would come back and say, I ain't trying to put on airs. I ain't trying to impress somebody. I just love Jesus. <laughs> Number one is their substance over status. Number two is their calling over circumstances. Calling, he says he emptied himself. The idea is the kenosis. It means that uh, some take it that Jesus emptied some of his divinity in his incarnation. Uh, that's not the sense. No, the sense is that when Jesus came to this earth, it, it's his pre-existence. He existed in the form of God, but when he came to earth, he emptied the right to exercise, the prerogative to exercise deity. So when we see his... His ministry, he's depended totally upon the Father. His substance didn't change, but the responsibility and the role in which he functioned changed. And so instead of simply doing what he can do on his own, he did it by teaching us, being an example of what it means to lean on the Father and to lean on the work of the Holy Spirit to do the work that he does. But his essence did not change. So some say, well, he emptied of himself his divinity. No, here's the issue. He poured himself into his calling. So look what it says. Let's read it again. It says, he, he became, took the form of a bond servant. That doesn't mean much to us, and we struggle with that as African Americans. Really, it's a slave. It's someone who voluntarily puts himself into slavery. We were forcibly taken against our will. That was against God. That's not, not of God. Matter of fact, you want to know much of the racism and discrimination is because this was a nation that claimed to love Jesus and didn't even follow him by oppressing and enslaving a people. Amen. But the point is, Paul here is making is that Jesus willingly did everything to descend to the lowest point to connect with people to fulfill his calling. He went to the nth degree. I'm going to, watch this, I'm going to fully exhaust what it means to be human. So watch this. It's not something I read in a book about you, but I know what it means to be arrested and falsely accused. I know what it means to be single and folk try to ostracize me as if I'm not spiritual because I ain't married. I, I know what it means to be an ethnic Jew in a racially oppressive Roman society that demonizes me and brutalizes me because of the color of my skin. I don't have to read it in a book. I, I completely pour myself into the human experience. Watch this. And I stay with it. I stay with the calling. I, I don't allow the experiences to deter me 
for what I know the Father has for me. So look what it says. He humbled himself, meaning it wasn't easy, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Stay with me. And so he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's in the garden. If at all possible, take this cup from me. Listen to me. To follow Jesus means sometimes God's going to ask us to do some stuff we don't understand. But we trust him because we believe it's for our benefit. Jesus here, watch this, he, he understands the struggle. He had, watch this, he had to humble himself. He didn't just walk in, okay, I'm just going to go on to the cross. Go on and nail me. It's easy. Come on. Boom. Booyah. It didn't work that way. It was a struggle. And as Christians, we don't want to admit this. It's a struggle to follow God. Oh, 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 yes, it is. Don't get all holy on me and think that you got it together. Some of y'all just struggle to come to church. It's a struggle to follow God. It's a struggle to obey him. And he's saying, I, I, I know what that's like, but I'm telling you, if you trust him, the outcome and the benefit is for us. Even when I can't see it. And some of you, that's where you are. You want to see it. And Jesus said, no, I know what it feels like to not be able to see what I'm calling you to do. But I need you to trust my heart when you can't see my hand. I, I need you to trust me. I need you to obey me. And so there's so many ways I can go on this one. Um, and I'll do what I did in the first service. This whole sex issue that's out of control in our culture. You live in a very highly, or we, I shouldn't say you, we all live in a very highly sexualized culture. Sex defines everything. That's for married and singles. And we ain't just picking on singles here. Trust me, singles, as many problems you having sexually, couples are having the same ones, maybe more. Okay, because of the culture. And here's what the culture teaches us. That sex is sexual healing, it's just physical, and it'll simply help you feel better about yourself. And I'm telling you, the biblical vision of sexuality is that not only is it physical, and it is given to be enjoyed within the context of marriage, but it also affects our emotion, it affects our minds. And what happens is many times that when we engage these relationships, and in my 20 years of, of, of pastoring, I'm telling you, folk get broken. You, you don't leave an intimate relationship and remain the same person. And so when God says, trust me on this, he's not trying to keep you from having fun. And listen to me, if you're feeling this guilt and condemnation, that's not, that's not the goal here. I need you to be freed up to hear God's heart. This, this ain't, a, a, ain't a beat you up sermon. That's, that's not the goal here. But to understand, when God says, trust me to obey me in a certain area, he really has our benefit in my mind. And so many times that brokenness, the sex issue, or pornography, or whatever it is, it's a loneliness issue. We're not comfortable with us. And we can't be by ourselves for a moment to even work through that. The issues that we bring, many times there's some issues that God's dealing with us or the brokenness from our backgrounds or the brokenness in our family. And we think somebody out there can solve the brokenness. And Jesus is waiting. I made you. I know all about you. Don't you know if I made you, I can fix what's broken in your life? So it's a trust issue. It's an obedience. And he loves you so much. I don't want you to leave here with the wrong spirit. He loves you so much. Even if you decide to continue that path, you know what God does? He'll just sit on the side of your life and just wait. And here's what I know about God. He knows at some point we're going to get tired of that lifestyle. And it wears on us. And it takes the years off our life. We don't have the energy and the joy we used to have. And when we come running, here's what I love about the Lord. He doesn't bring up the past. He doesn't say, I told you, I just been waiting for you to come. I got nothing but love for you. I got nothing but grace for you. I got nothing but hope for you. I'm so glad you've come in to what I have for you. Would you come on and just trust me? Um, the other side, this, the other side, this I want to deal with criticism. 
Put here um, Philippians uh, chapter 1, verses 12 through 20, specifically 15 through 17. Because in the context of Paul, his cross, he's dealing with his critics. And so remember now, he's, he's under, house, under house arrest. He's this nationally known apostle. He's getting all this hate. He's dealing with his critics. I love his spirit in the midst of criticism. I'm like, Lord, whatever you put in Paul, would you put a little bit of that in me? Because I'm going to tell you, as a pastor, I don't always respond like him. Look what it says, verse 15. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. So Paul says, look, I got some supporters that I've raised. These are people he's discipled, and they're actually preaching the gospel for the right reasons. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. I got my critics out there. These are folk I help. These are folk I minister to. These are folk that I led to Christ. These are folk I disciple. And they're hating on me in my imprisonment. They are my critics. Watch what he says. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense. Can I say it like I want to? Whether in foolishness <laughs> or in truth. Christ is proclaimed. I said, Lord, would you give me some of that? He still remained positive in spite of his critics because he knows that God will complete what he started in his life. And it's a word about you as a follower, as a follower of Jesus, particularly as we get deeper in the 21st century. Christianity, and if you are a Christian, you're going to be criticized. You're going to be talked about. And many times, you ain't got to know them. Come on now. You ain't got to know them. They just start picking on you and talking about you, and you haven't done a thing. And you got to know how to handle your critics. You can't let your critics deter you from what God has for your life. So let me give you three things very quickly. Number one, how do you handle criticism? Very quickly. Number one, oh, here we go. Critics, criticism not always, not always about you. You got to remember that. You got to step back and say, okay, who's the criticism about? The angriest people are those who are hurting the most. Some of you are being criticized because you have a sense of wholeness. And you got a sense of progression. You got a sense of, of growth in your life. And some folk hate on that. They want to be, they in the pit, and they want you to be in the pit. They're like, I don't want to be down all by myself. And they're trying to drag you down. And you got to know that. There's something really going on with them. And so the, tr the saying is true, hurt people hurt people, right? And many times what we criticize the most reveals what we understand the least. Sometimes you cannot explain to people what God is doing in your life. They don't understand it. Guess what? They don't have to. So you have to stay focused as Paul stayed focused. Number one, criticism is not always about you. Number two, you got to pause. Pause before you respond. And here we got to really think about what we say. And I, I love this quote, and I want to say it. We feel offended when people shoot at us or criticize us. We feel justified when we criticize others. Isn't that true? Folk criticize, they show wrong in me. But when we criticize them, yeah, that feel right. Yeah, I find and maybe sometimes in the criticism, God is saying, step back. I want you to feel, it doesn't feel good when you're going through it. You need to think about when you dish it out. And so sometimes we got to pause. Because here's what I know. When I respond in emotion, it gets worse. But if I respond with wisdom and forethought, it gets better and I feel better. And here's the last one. Criticism is about your deeply held convictions. How do you deal with criticism? Those are the times that you respond with your convictions, your values, what you believe, what you stand for. And it's something about responding out of a place of conviction and what is right that God honors every time. Jesus went to that cross and stood on the truth that this is what's for my life. And yet he put himself in a place of complete vulnerability. And in that place, because he stood on the calling, God raised him up. And that's exactly what God does. You stand on what God says. You stand on what you know to be right and true. Not in arrogance. Not in thinking you better than the next person, but because this is, this is what has been anchored in my soul, and this is a function of who I am. 
Substance over status, calling over circumstance. And here's the last one, triumph over tragedy. Tragedy. Therefore also God highly exalted him and bestowed upon him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue co confess. Jesus, when he was risen from the dead, he walked uh, 40 days on this earth, and then he was ascended to heaven, Acts chapter 1, and seated at the right hand of the Father. And that inaugurated a new era of the kingdom. And it speaks a word about God's creation, that the world that we see today is not the way God intended it to be, that one day in the future, Jesus will finalize and complete the goodness that he wants for the world. Matter of fact, in the meantime, or in this temporary parentheses, the church is in the world to make a difference, looking forward to the ultimate and the final difference. And so here's what it means. It means for this, if Jesus conquered his tragedy, and I believe this with all my heart, you may go through difficulty, you may have some suffering, you may even experience some losses, but death evil and sin will never have the final word in your life. I, I don't know how God will turn that out, but in some form or fashion, God's going to turn it around. Last Sunday, we talked about Ruth. She lost her, her son. She lost her husband. She was by herself. You would have thought her life was over. But that wasn't the final story. David went through his struggles in the wilderness 20 years. He was anointed to be the king. Saul tried to kill him two or three times. But that was not the final story. Jesus hung, bled, and died 2,000 years ago on a cross. The devil thought it was over. But thank God, early on a Sunday morning, he got up with all power. I don't know how God's going to do it. But if you're going through it, that is not the last word. He will finish what he started. He will complete what he promised in your life. Hold on to God. You will experience the triumph in this life. One way or another. I believe that with all my heart. And so here's my word. Here's my word. Here's my word. Here's, all, here's what I'm trying to do with Jesus. We get into this series. Here it is. It's very simple. I, 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 I want us to reinvest in our walk with God. Some of you are at a place where you're walking with him and you're good. And I, want, I, I believe God wants us to take it deeper and to draw closer to him, particularly in this series and hereafter. You're at a certain place. Just as when you first came to Christ, you had to adjust some things in your life to know him, to, to kind of get on his schedule, whether it's your, your routine of worship or your personal walk with him or your ministry or whatever. You had to readjust your life. I'm saying to you, as we get to know Jesus, allow him to readjust your life that you can even go deeper and go closer with him. Let's invest in him since he is our good friend. I'm going to close with this, and I like this. I like this. And so came across a story of a farmer who had a herd of hogs, and he's feeding them. And when he feeds them, I mean, he's generous. I mean, he's very, very generous. And I mean, he's giving them double, triple portions. And the hogs, when they would come feed uh, at the trough, I mean, they would eat everything he puts in. That's what a hog, he doesn't have a stop button. He just eats, he just eats, 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 okay? And so after a while, one hog turned over to his fellow hog friend and said, you know what? He said, this, this farmer, you know, this farmer, he's being very generous with all this food. You, you think he has an agenda? <laughs> You'll catch that on the way home. Here's my point, and I believe this. I think sometimes the church believes that God's generosity indicates he has an agenda that somehow he's fattening us up for the kill. Newsflash, he already died. <laughs> he is fattening you up, <laughs> but he already died. He killed the sacrifice, and we are free to come to enjoy this relationship with him and to allow him to have his perfect way in our life and to know that even if it may make us uncomfortable, we will be the better. Father, we bless you and thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence. I just thank you for this series. I'm excited about it. Lord, to preach about you is such a daunting task. 
And so I rely on your anointing so much here today. And Lord, I pray that this was not condemnation. You don't condemn. You condemned all sin, devil, and evil at the cross. But Lord, I pray there was encouragement, hope to know that you love us, you wait on us, you are patient, but you want us to trust you. So I don't know who's here today, Father. I don't know. Maybe that's what that person feels, um, that you're fattening them up for the kill. I, I pray that you would really help them see in their engagement of you, the kill has already been done. I'm not trying to kill anybody. I'm not trying to take away somebody's fun. I'm not trying to handcuff someone's life. But moreover, to free up a life to love you and to love this world and to experience the abundant life and satisfaction you have for us. Thank you, Lord. We trust you today. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand to your feet. Turn to three people and tell them you can trust him. He's a good friend. Come on.